Greetings and welcome to Scriptures Unlocked. This presentation will be dissecting the significance of the table of showbread as it relates to Jesus Christ, as well as believers. But before getting into the holy place, I'd just like to spend a brief moment looking at the door to the holy place. So having passed the brazen altar of burnt offering and the bronze laver in the outer court, the door to the holy place was the next barrier that the priests encountered before entering in the presence of God. The sanctuary had three barriers that separated each section. The gate, which was the entrance to the outer court, the door, which is the entrance to the holy place, and the veil, which was the entrance to the most holy place. On screen, you can see the three barriers in magenta color. So here we see the door to the outer court. And in the outer court, we have the altar of burnt offering, the laver, and then you have the door here to the holy place. And in the holy place, we have the table of shoe bread, which we'll be looking at in this presentation, the seven branch candlestick, and the altar of incense. And then there was a veil that separated the holy place from the holy of holies or the most holy place. And in the most holy place, we had the Ark of the Covenant. So there were three separate sections to the tabernacle, the outer court, the door to the holy place, and the veil which separated the holy place from the most holy place. So the way into God's presence was through these three entrances, and they all refer to Jesus Christ. John 14, 6 tells us that Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man cometh unto the Father but by me. So the only way into the tabernacle was through the gate. So that was the only way. The door to the holy place represents the truth because in the holy place, we have the table of shoe bread, which represented the word of God. And Jesus told us that God's words are truth. And the veil separated the holy place from the most holy place. And in the most holy place, you are the presence of God Almighty, the source of all life. So the three entrances represents the way, the truth, and the life. The door of the tent to the holy place was similar to that of the gate to the outer court. It was also made of blue, purple, scarlet, and fine twined linen. And notice what we read in Exodus 26, verses 36 and 37. And thou shalt make an hanging for the door of the tent of blue and purple and scarlet and fine twined linen wrought with needlework. And thou shalt make for the hanging five pillars of shittim wood and overlay them with gold. And their hooks shall be of gold. And thou shalt cast five sockets of brass for them. On screen, you can see a picture of what the door might have looked like. So there were five pillars of shitty wood overlaid with gold, and the base of the pillars were supported by brass sockets. The shitty wood, as we looked at when we looked at the altar of burnt offering, represented Jesus' human nature, while the gold is symbolic of his divine nature. So the dual nature of Christ, that is, he was son of man and son of God. So the dual nature of Christ is seen at the door to the holy place with the five pillars symbolizing God's grace towards humanity, despite his judgment represented by the bronze sockets. God's judgment against sin was satisfied by the righteous sacrifice of his son, Jesus Christ, on the cross of Calvary. Jesus took the judgment of our sins upon himself, and grace, mercy, and peace were extended to humanity as a result. Psalm 85 verse 10 tells us this. Mercy and truth are met together. Righteousness and peace have kissed each other. And that was only made possible through the sacrifice of Jesus Christ. The door with its various colors prevents us from crossing the threshold of the tabernacle without getting another look at Jesus Christ as the way into the sanctuary. Let's now enter the holy place. And here you can see a picture of the inner compartments of the sanctuary. You have the holy place. So here you have the table of shoe bread, 
the seven branch candlestick and the altar of incense. And then you have the veil that separated the holy place from the most holy place. And in the most holy place, we have the Ark of the Covenant. So let's now look at the table of shewbread. And here's what God instructed Moses as it related to the table of shewbread. Exodus 25 verses 23 onwards tells us this. Thou shalt also make a table of shittim wood. Two cubits shall be the length thereof, and a cubit the breadth thereof, and a cubit and a half the height thereof. And thou shalt overlay it with pure gold, and make thereto a crown of gold round about. And thou shalt make unto it a board of an handbreadth round about. And thou shalt make a golden crown to the border thereof round about. And thou shalt make for it four rings of gold, and put the rings in the four corners that are on the four feet thereof. Over against the border shall the rings be for places of the staves to bear the table. And thou shalt make the staves of shitty wood and overlay them with gold, that the table may be borne with them. So the length of the table was three feet. Two cubits equals 36 inches or three feet. The width of the table was one and a half feet. And the height of the table was two and a quarter feet or 2.25 feet. God continues by saying this to Moses, Exodus 25, verse 29 and 30. And thou shalt make the dishes thereof, and spoons thereof, and covers thereof, and bowls thereof, to cover withal. Of pure gold shalt thou make them. And thou shalt set upon the table shewbread before me always. So the table was a place where the priests would meet and fellowship with God by eating the showbread in his presence. It was a place of communion provision, and sustenance. The table of shewbread was also known as the bread of the presence. The Hebrew words translated as shewbread are lehem, Strong's H3899, and panim, Strong's H6440, which means bread and presence respectively. The Hebrew word, and you can see the Hebrew script of the word for bread, it's lehem. It appears 297 times in the King James Version of the Hebrew Scriptures. It is translated bread 237 times, food 21 times, meat 18 times, and shoe bread with Strong's H 6440 five times. The Hebrew word for presence is panim, and it occurs 2,109 times in the Hebrew Scriptures. It is translated as before, 1,137 times, face, 390 times, and presence, 76 times. So the shoe bread was also known as the bread of the presence. Lehem is the Hebrew word for bread. Panim is the Hebrew word for presence or face. So on the table of shoe bread were placed 12 loaves in two rows of six, and they were to be prepared and baked every Sabbath. Notice the instructions that was given as it relates to the baking of the shewbread. Leviticus 24, verse 5 onwards. And thou shalt take fine flour and bake 12 cakes thereof. Two tenth deals shall be in one cake. And thou shalt set them in two rows, six on a row, upon the pure table before Jehovah. And thou shalt put pure frankincense upon each row that it may be on the bread for a memorial, even an offering made by fire unto Jehovah. Every Sabbath, he shall set it in order before Jehovah continually, being taken from the children of Israel by an everlasting covenant. And it shall be Aaron's and his sons, and they shall eat it in the holy place, for it is most holy unto him of the offerings of Jehovah, made by fire by a perpetual statute. So. The shewbread were for Aaron and his sons who were the priests. It was for them and them alone. However, the Levites who assisted the priests in the ministration of the sanctuary, there were three sons of Levi, the son of Jacob, Merari, Gershon, and Kohath. It was the Kohathites who were responsible for preparing the shewbread every Sabbath. 
And this we find from 1 Chronicles chapter 9, verse 32. And other of their brethren, of the sons of the Kohathites, were over the shoebread to prepare it every Sabbath. So each of the three sons of Levi were given responsibility as it relates to work in the sanctuary. But the priests were the one who were to eat the shoebread. The shoebread was replaced every Sabbath and was only to be eaten by the priests in the holy place. However, there was an instance where David and his men were given the shoebread to eat, which was not lawful. And we find this in 1 Samuel 21, reading from verse 1 onwards. David takes consecrated bread. Then came David to Nob to Ahimelech, the priest. And this was when David was being pursued by Saul. And he was a fugitive, essentially, in his own country. And Ahimelech was afraid at the meeting of David, because David was a wanted man. And said unto him, Why art thou alone, and no man with thee? And David said unto Ahimelech, the priest, The king had commanded me a business, and had said unto me, Let no man know anything of the business whereabout I send thee, and what I have commanded thee, and I have appointed my servants to such and such a place. This was clearly a lie that David told the priest. David was on the run from Saul. Now therefore, what is under thine hand? Give me five loaves of bread in mine hand, or what there is present. And the priest answered David and said, There is no common bread under mine hand, but there is hallowed bread, or in other words, there is shoe bread. If the young men have kept themselves at least from women, and David answered the priest and said unto him, Of a truth, women have been kept from us about these three days since I came out. And the vessels of the young men are holy, and the bread is in a manner common, yea, though it were sanctified this day in the vessel. So the priest gave him hallowed bread, for there was no bread there but the shoe bread that was taken from before Yehovah to put hot bread in the day when it was taken away. Incidentally, as a result of the priest Ahimelech helping David by providing him with Food in the form of shoe bread, he also gave him Goliath's sword. 85 priests were slain as a result when Saul found out because Doeg, the Edomite, who was there at the day when David came, told Saul what had transpired. And Saul came and gave instructions for the men to kill the priests. But the men refused. And Doeg was the one who actually carried out that order. So as a result of helping David, the priests, 85 of them, lost their lives because Saul called them traitors because he was pursuing David and he wanted to slay David. So this incident was referenced by Jesus to make the point that it is lawful. And notice the word lawful is underlined to do well on the Sabbath days. Jesus referenced the same incident where David ate the shoe bread. To make the point that it is lawful to do good on the Sabbath days. Notice what we read in Matthew 12. And at that time, Jesus went on the Sabbath day through the corn. And his disciples were and hungry. They were hungry. And began to pluck the ears of corn and to eat. Just as how David was hungry. But when the Pharisees saw it, they said unto him, Behold, thy disciples do that which is not lawful to do upon the Sabbath day. But he said unto them, Have ye not read what David did? When he was an hungered, and they that were with him, how he entered into the house of God and did eat the shoe bread, which was not lawful for him to eat, neither for them which were with him, but only for the priests. And this confirmed what we said earlier that the shoe bread was only for the priests to consume in the holy place. Or have you not read in the law how that on the Sabbath days the priests in the temple profane the Sabbath and are blameless? The shoe bread had to be prepared on the Sabbath. No work was to be done on the Sabbath. The Sabbath command says, Six days shalt thou labor and do all thy work. But the seventh day is the Sabbath of Jehovah thy God. In it thou shalt do no work. Thou, nor thy son, nor thy daughter, nor thy manservant, nor thy maidservant, or anyone that is within thy gate. So the priests, they had to work on Sabbath. They had to bake the bread on Sabbath. The bread had to be prepared hot. And the, one that, the ones that were there had to be replaced with a freshly baked bread on the Sabbath. All work had to be done 
on the preparation day, which is the day before the Sabbath. And this is what Jesus was saying. The priests profane the Sabbath because they had to do the work of the sanctuary by baking the bread and doing the work of the sanctuary on the Sabbath day. But yet still, Jesus said they were accounted blameless. And Jesus then went on to say, but I say unto you that in this place is one greater than the temple. Jesus made a point that he is greater than the temple because all the things of the sanctuary prefigured and foreshadowed him as we are finding out in this series on the sanctuary. Jesus went on to say, for the son of man is Lord even of the Sabbath day. So what was happening as well was that there was a man whose hand was withered and Jesus healed him on the Sabbath. And Jesus made a point, which of you, if you had an animal who fell in a ditch on the Sabbath, they would not take him out of the, out of the, out of the ditch. And Jesus made a point that it is lawful to do good on the Sabbath. So if somebody is in need, it is lawful to do good on the Sabbath. And that is, that is what the priest did when David was hungry. Viewers, the table of shewbread was placed on the north side of the holy place. Notice what we are told in scripture. Exodus 26 verse 35 says this. And thou shalt set the table without the veil and the candlestick over against the table on the side of the tabernacle toward the south. And thou shalt put the table on the north side. This is also repeated in Exodus 40 verse 22 and 23. And he put the table in the tent of the congregation upon the side of the tabernacle northward without the veil. And he set the bread in order upon it before Jehovah, as Jehovah had commanded Moses. And here we can see a picture of the holy place. This is the table of shoe bread with the two stacks of bread, six on each row. This is the north. This is the south. The candlestick was on the south side. The altar of incense was before the veil. And this was the veil that separated the holy place from the most holy place. So the position of the table of shewbread on the north side is significant because it is the place where God's throne and city is located. Notice what Psalm 48 verse 1 and 2 tells us. Great is Jehovah and greatly to be praised in the city of our God, in the mountain of his holiness. Beautiful for situation, the joy of the whole earth is Mount Zion, on the sides of the north, the city of the great king. Viewers, this is where the devil wanted to sit when he thought to exalt himself. And we are told this, God gives us a peek into what the devil was thinking in Isaiah 14, verse 12 and 13. How art thou fallen from heaven, O Lucifer, son of the morning? How art thou cut down to the ground, which didst weaken the nations? Why? For thou hast said in thine heart, I will ascend into heaven. I will exalt my throne above the stars of God. I will sit also upon the mount of the congregation. Where? Where is the mount of the congregation? In the sides of the north. That is where God dwelt. That is where God's throne was. And the devil wanted to sit where God sat. He wanted to be like the Most High. So the table of shewbread was the throne of God and his son in the holy place. This was represented by the fact that crowns of gold were placed round about the border of the table and speaks to his kingship. And here you are seeing a picture of the table of shewbread. And you can see the crowns of gold around the table as well as underneath. You have the 12 loaves, six on each row. And you have the frankincense on top of each row. So this is what the table of shewbread might have looked like. It was made of acacia wood or shittim wood overlaid with gold. And there were 12 loaves placed in two rows, six on each row. The 12 loaves placed in two stacks of six on the table of shewbread represented the people of God, the 12 tribes of Israel. It represented the congregation and the two stacks was known as the mount of the congregation. It looked like a mountain. There were two rows because both the father and the son sat upon and ruled over the mount of the congregation. 
after Jesus' ascension, viewers, he went directly to the holy place of the heavenly sanctuary and sat at the right hand of God on the table of shewbread. Notice what we are told in Hebrews, reading from chapter 1 onwards. God, who is the Father, who at sundry times and in diverse manners spake in time past unto the fathers by the prophets, hath in these last days spoken unto us by his Son, whom he hath appointed heir of all things. So Jesus is the heir, he is the Prince of heaven, by whom also he made the worlds, who being the brightness of his glory and the express image of his person, and upholding all things by the word of his power, when he had by himself purged our sins after the cross. After going to the cross and purging our sins, sat down on the right hand of the majesty on high. Now of the things which we have spoken, this is the sum. We have such an high priest, who is Jesus Christ, who is set on the right hand of the throne of the majesty in the heavens. So if Jesus is on the right hand, it means that his father, who is the majesty of, of in heaven, sits on the left. Jesus is on the right hand of the Father. Hebrews 10 verse 12 says, But this man, speaking of Jesus again, after he had offered one sacrifice for sins forever, sat down on the right hand of God. Hebrews 12 verse 2, Looking unto Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith, who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross, despising the shame, and is set down at the right hand of the throne of God. So viewers, it is absolutely clear that Jesus shares his father's throne. And that is precisely why there were two rows of bread on the table of shoe bread. The shoe bread represented Jesus Christ as the bread of life. And he made it clear, very clear, that the manna also represented him as the living bread. Both the manna and the shoe bread were also symbolic of the word of God. In a subsequent presentation after this series is concluded, I will do a presentation on the manna because the manna has significance as it relates to Jesus. The manna, as we'll find out not too long from now, represented the flesh of Jesus. And the manna was used as a test to point the children of Israel and to show them the importance of the Sabbath. So a subsequent presentation will be done on the manna to show the significance of the manna and what God was trying to teach or what God was teaching the children of Israel by giving them manna for 40 years in the wilderness. So the shoe bread represented Jesus as the bread of life and both the manna and the shoe bread were symbolic of the word of God. Notice what God told the children of Israel in Deuteronomy chapter 8. And thou shalt remember all the way which Jehovah thy God led thee these 40 years in the wilderness to humble thee and to prove thee or to test thee to know what was in thine heart, whether thou would, wouldest keep his commandments or no. And notice verse 3. And he humbled thee and suffered thee to hunger and fed thee with manna which thou knewest not. Neither did thy fathers know that he might make thee know that man doth not live by bread alone but by every word that proceeded out of the mouth of Jehovah, doth man live. The manna was bread, but it represented every word that proceeded out of the mouth of God. Deuteronomy 8 verse 11 says, Beware that thou forget not Jehovah thy God in not keeping his commandments and his judgments and his statutes, which I command thee this day. Verse 16 says, Who fed thee in the wilderness with manna, which thy fathers knew not, that he might humble thee, and that he might prove thee to do thee good at the latter end. And notice now how Jesus linked the manna that the Israelites ate in the wilderness to himself. John chapter 6 gives us the link that Jesus made. Then they said unto him, the people that is, what shall we do that we might work the works of God? Jesus answered and said unto them, this is the work of God that he believe on him whom he had sent. They said therefore unto him, what sign showest thou then that we may see and believe thee? What dost thou work? Our fathers did eat manna in the desert. And as it is written, he gave them bread from heaven to eat. Then Jesus said unto them, Verily, verily, I say unto you, Moses gave you not that bread from heaven, but my father gave it you the true bread from heaven. For the bread of God is he which cometh down from heaven 
and giveth life unto the world. Then said they unto him, Lord, evermore, give us this bread. And Jesus said unto them, I am the bread of life. He that cometh to me shall never hunger, and he that believeth on me shall never thirst, because Jesus is also the water of life. John 6, 38 says, For I came down from heaven, not to do mine own will, but the will of him that sent me. John 6, 41 and 42 says this, The Jews then murmured at him, because he said, I am the bread which came down from heaven. And they said, Is not this Jesus, the son of Joseph, whose father and mother we know? How is it then that he said, I came down from heaven? John 6, 47 and 48 says, Jesus answered them, Verily, verily, I say unto you, He that believeth on me, hath everlasting life. I am that bread of life. Your fathers did eat manna in the wilderness and are dead. This is the bread which cometh down from heaven, that a man may eat thereof and not die. I am the living bread which came down from heaven. If any man eat of this bread, he shall live forever. And the bread that I will give is my flesh, which I will give for the life of the world. So Jesus here links the bread or the manna to his flesh, which he said he will give for the world. So the manna and the shoe bread was symbolic of Jesus' flesh and his body. John 6, 52 and 53 says this, The Jews therefore strove amongst themselves, saying, How can this man give us his flesh to eat? Then Jesus said unto them, Verily, verily, I say unto you, Except ye eat the flesh of the Son of Man, and drink his blood, ye have no life in you. Whoso eateth my flesh and drinketh my blood hath eternal life, and I will raise him up at the last day. For my flesh is meat indeed, and my blood is drink indeed. He that eateth my flesh and drinketh my blood dwelleth in me, and I in him. As the living Father hath sent me, and I live by the Father. So he that eateth me, even he shall live by me. Jesus then says, This is that bread which came down from heaven. Not as your fathers did eat manna and are dead. He that eateth of this bread shall live forever. Viewers, the people thought that Jesus was speaking in a cannibalistic sense, but that was not what Jesus was saying. Jesus was using symbolic language when he was speaking to them. He was making the link between the manna that the Israelites ate in the wilderness to himself, to his body and his flesh, but they did not get it. So Jesus was clearly speaking in symbolic language, which he explained at the Last Supper. So notice what Jesus said to his disciples at the Last Supper. Luke 22, verses 14 onwards. And when the hour was come, he sat down and the 12 apostles with him. And he said unto them, with desire, I have desired to eat this Passover with you before I suffer. For I say unto you, I will not any more eat thereof until it be fulfilled in the kingdom of God. And he took the cup and gave thanks and said, Take this and divide it among yourselves. Verse 19 says, And he took bread and gave thanks and brake it and gave unto them, saying, This is my body. So there's a link between the bread and this body, which is given for you. This do in remembrance of me. Likewise also the cup after supper, saying, this cup is a New Testament in my blood, which is shed for you. So the wine was symbolic of his blood, which was going to be shed for you and for many, for all humanity. But behold, the hand of him that betrayed me is with me on the table. So viewers, the Last Supper is clearly another allusion to the table of shoe bread. Because at the Last Supper, there was a table. There were 12 apostles and there was bread on the table. The Lord's table is where communion and fellowship takes place with the breaking of bread as a family. And generally speaking, table is where people come together to share a meal. The table of shoe bread represents Jesus as the bread of life. And it was no coincidence that the Messiah was also born in Bethlehem, Judah, which means house of bread and praise. Remember we said earlier that the Hebrew word for bread is lehem. The Hebrew word for house is Beth. Now when Jesus was born in Bethlehem of Judea, in the days of Herod, the king, behold, there came wise men from the east to Jerusalem, saying, 
Where is he that is born king of the Jews? For we have seen his star in the east and are come to worship him. When Herod the king had heard these things, he was troubled and all Jerusalem with him. And when he had gathered all the chief priests and scribes of the people together, he demanded of them where Christ should be born. And they said unto him, in Bethlehem of Judea, for thus it is written by the prophet, and it was written by Micah, Micah 5 verse 2. And thou, Bethlehem, in the land of Judah, art not the least among the princes of Judah, for out of thee shall come a governor that shall rule my people Israel, because Jesus sits upon the mount of the congregation along with his father, and they both rule over God's people. Notice what we find here. We are seeing here the Greek script of the word for Bethlehem. It is a proper locative noun. It is of Hebrew origin. It is comprised of two Hebrew words, Beth, which means house, and Lehem, which means bread. So Bethlehem means house of bread, just as our Bethel means house of God. And Bethlehem was a village about six miles south of Jerusalem. So Bethlehem means house of bread. Jesus, as the bread of life, was born in the house of bread. Judah simply means praise. Judah was the fourth son of Jacob, who was renamed Israel. And the very first place that the name Judah is mentioned in the scriptures is in Genesis 29, verse 35, when Leah conceived again and bare a son. And she said, no, will I praise, that's the meaning of Judah, Yehovah. Therefore, she called his name Judah and left bearing. So Judah means praise. Therefore, viewers, the sanctuary with its table of shoe bread was indeed a house of bread and praise because it was a place where the priests and people resorted for sustenance and worship. And in Psalm 150, we are told to praise Jehovah in his sanctuary. Praise him. The table of shoe bread also has significance for believers under the new covenant because it reminds us that we must constantly feed on the bread of life by studying the word of God. It is the written word of God that reminds us of the living bread, Jesus Christ, who gave his, himself for us. Under the old covenant viewers, only the Levitical priesthood could eat from the table of shoe bread. But today, Christians are a chosen generation, a royal priesthood, and holy nation, a peculiar people called out of darkness into God's marvelous light. So now under the new covenant, everyone can now partake of and share in holy communion with our Lord Jesus Christ. Notice what we find in 1 Corinthians 10, verses 16 and 17. The cup of blessing which we bless, is it not the communion of the blood of Christ? The bread which we break, is it not the communion of the body of Christ? So there again we see that the wine that Christians drink at communion represents the blood of Christ, which was shed for all of us. The bread which we break and eat represents the body of Christ which was broken for us. For we, being many, are one bread and one body. For we are all partakers of that one bread. And that one bread is Jesus Christ, the bread of life. Therefore, viewers, the table of shoe bread remind Christians of the communion we should have with God the Father and the Son. And 1 Corinthians chapter 11, verse 26 and 27 tells us this about the communion that we share in when we fellowship with God and each other at the Lord's table. For as often as you eat this bread and drink this cup, you do show the Lord's death till he come. Wherefore, whosoever shall eat this bread and drink this cup of the Lord unworthily shall be guilty of the body and blood of the Lord. So viewers, the table of shoe bread, as you can see over my left shoulder, represented Jesus Christ as the bread of life. It also represented the word of God. So as Christians, we ought to study God's word, digest it, assimilate it, and live out God's 
holy character in our lives. So the table of shoebread was very significant because it pointed to Jesus Christ as the bread of life, which gave himself for humanity. He was that bread which came down from heaven so that whosoever eat of his bread is having communion with the Father and the Son. So when we partake of communion, we are showing, we are sharing in the death of Christ and we are remembering the great sacrifice that he made for all humanity because he said, this is my body which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. The table of shoe bread represented Jesus Christ as the bread of life. The holy place had three items. The table of shoe bread, which we have looked at in this presentation, it represented provision, sustenance, the word of God. It pointed to Jesus Christ as the bread of life. So when we study God's word, in the light of the Holy Spirit, which we will look at in the next presentation, we look at the candlestick. The table of shoe bread was on the north side and the holy place was illuminated by the seven branch candlestick. So we study the word of God in the light of the revelation of the Holy Spirit. Because as we read the word of God, it is the Holy Spirit that gives us understanding and knowledge of God the Father and the Son. So the table of shoe bread was very important because it pointed to Jesus Christ as the bread of life. And the bread of life is he that came down from heaven, Jesus Christ, so that we might have life and have it more abundantly. Thanks for listening. Thanks for watching. And may God continue to bless us as we feast upon the bread of life. Have yourselves a wonderful day.